During 6502, Logic Operations. I'm Dr. Matt Regan. Unfortunately, I have a bit of a cold at the moment, but I wanted to get this video out. But don't worry, I'm sure you can't catch it through the internet. This is the architecture for the Turing 6502, which we've discussed previously. We've gone over the hardware in a lot of detail. Now I'm discussing the software that goes in the ROMs in the upper left-hand corner. In order to do that, I'm doing a deep dive into all of the instructions in the 6502 and all of the addressing modes. We've covered a lot of ground in this video series, and hopefully you're starting to get a good feel for how the machine works. I want to go over where we've been and a quick review of where we're going. The first two videos were of the theory behind the rulebook and the notepad. After that, we had to set up the control signals, we did the bring up, and finally, a printed circuit board build. Perhaps most importantly, the printed circuit board build included some blinking lights in the form of seven segment displays, and it lets us know what the machine's doing. After that, we went on to the fetch, decode, execute cycle. This is one of the most important concepts of the von Neumann architecture. It tells us how the machine actually works, but it's hard to divine it from pictures of registers, buses, and ALUs. In the conditional branch and jump video, we started looking at specific 6502 instructions. It's often stated that a conditional branch is required to make a microprocessor Turing complete, but this isn't strictly true, although I'll save the argument for another video. Next, I went over the two index registers in the 6502, and this is required to understand the two subsequent videos on absolute addressing and zero page addressing. In this video and the next, we're going to go over logical operations and then arithmetic operations after that. Collectively, these cover most of the function of the ALU. After that, we'll look at the stack and subroutine calls, and finally, we'll look at the reset procedure. This is John von Neumann who the von Neumann architecture is named after. He's a Hungarian-born World War II mathematician who worked on the Manhattan Project. In fact, he proved that the implosion method used in the Trinity device here was better than the gun method. He wrote this paper, titled First Draft of a Report on the EDVAC, which defined many of the core features of the von Neumann architecture including the arithmetic logic unit. On the 6502 architecture, the arithmetic logic unit is presented here in blue. It's tightly associated with the accumulator and the status register. There are three hidden registers it uses, the A register, the B register, and the hold register. I've used a slightly different naming convention than the 6502. I just use one register for the accumulator and the A reg, and I call it A reg. The B register is still just B reg, and I don't actually have a hold register. I've separated out the arithmetic and the logic functions, and in this video we're going to go over the logic operations. These are AND, OR, XOR, and BIT. In the next video, I'll go over rotate and shift, although shift left can be considered an arithmetic operation. Let's start off by looking at the AND operation. Before I go to look onto a specific example, we need to look at the immediate addressing mode in a bit more detail. I did cover it previously, but that was for specific instructions. Let's look at the general form for this addressing mode. In immediate mode, there are two bytes per instruction, the opcode and the operand. The operand is used by the ALU, and it's located in the memory address immediately after the instruction opcode. Let me show you an example. Here we have a fragment of code, but when we get down to 87A7, we see the AND immediate instruction. The value 2 in the next location, A7A8, is used by the ALU. What does the code for this new addressing mode look like? Well, first we increment the program counter. Then we just move program counter low into effective address low and program counter high into effective address high. Then, as usual, we call second pass decode. I'm going to get a bit tricky though with the state machine implementation. I'm going to increment the program counter, but I'm not going to store it in EAL and EAH. 
What's important is that the value is stored in the memory address register, and this should happen automatically by incrementing the program calendar. This is the AND instruction on the 6502 microprocessor. Hopefully all these different addressing modes are becoming familiar to you by now. Typically, an AND gate has two inputs and an output. For the output to be high, input M and input N both need to be high, otherwise the output will be low. But the 6502 operates on 8 bits at a time, so how does this work? Well, let's start with the first bit. Bit 0 from the accumulator is transferred into bit 0 of the A register. The B register, including bit 0, is usually loaded during the decode phase of the fetch decode execute cycle. Bit 0 from the A register and the B register are fed into an AND gate. The output of the AND gate is captured by the hold register, which in turn gets fed back into the accumulator. This is done in parallel for all of the 8 bits within a byte. Note that the bits are actually independent, so the result of bit 0 has no impact on the result of bit 1. This isn't true for all operations, but it is true for AND or an XOR. There are 8 different AND instructions, but for now I'm just going to focus on the ones that use a 0 page, immediate and absolute addressing modes. We add these into our decode switch statement. We need to add them to our second pass decode. Note that they all jump to the same state machine. Inside AND, we fetch the B register from main memory. We perform the logical AND operation and store the result in the A register. Then update the negative and the zero flags, which can be computed directly from the value in the A register. In diagrammatic form for the rulebook, we include these arcs to these various instructions at the instruction decode node, which is rule 28. In second pass decode, we add these instructions to rule 29. Here I've drawn it as a single arc with three different labels. We also initiate the memory read for the B register at this stage. Remember from Turing's paper that the machine's only aware of one value at a time, but we can store a second value in the form of a rule number, which Turing has called an M configuration here. We read the value from main memory into the B register, then fan out into one of 256 different rules. In each of these rules, we read the A register, and we write back the value of A, logically ended, with the value of B. Then finally, we need to set or clear the appropriate flags. And we do this by calling a state machine that does exactly what we want. All possible combinations of the flags need to have their own state machine. It's not so bad here, but later on we'll see examples where we're trying to set four flags at a time. In this example, from location 87A7, we should sequentially go through rules 28, 326, 29, 2023, 2026, and back to 74. Now let's see if the machine that we've actually built does this. Excellent. The next instruction to look at is the ORA instruction. The 6502 has eight of these. Like AND gates, OR gates have two inputs and an output. And the output will be high when input M or input N is high. And the machine to encode this is very similar to our AND instruction. The only significant difference is what's written back into the A register and which status update machine it jumps to. The exclusive OR instruction is next. All of these need an arc out of Rule 28 and Rule 29. Similarly, we have an exclusive OR gate where the output's high if input M is different to input N. Again, this is very similar to our AND instruction. I hope you're seeing a bit of a pattern forming here. Once AND was done, OR and exclusive OR were pretty straightforward. The last instruction I'm going to go over in this video is the bit instruction. I struggled with this quite a bit, and in retrospect, I can't quite see why. It's basically the same as the AND instruction, except we have some different circumstances for setting the negative flag and the overflow flag. 
the zero flags the same. And the only other big difference is that we write A back into the A register rather than A and B. When you think about it, I'm not really calculating anything at runtime. I'm just storing all possible combinations for the AND, OR, XOR, and BIT instructions. I'll end this video here. In the next video, I'll go over shifts and rotates. But for now, remember to like, share, and subscribe.